My name's Gordon Palmer, I'm minister here at Claremont Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday, um, 8th of August. Again, we are uh, following in our series and through the book of Ezekiel, and the title of today's service is Easy Hope, Hard Hope. As well as myself taking part in the service, and Colin will be reading the scriptures to us, and Tim Ward will be leading us in our prayers for others. Jesus said, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So we think of that open-armed invitation, that open-armed welcome of God as we sing our first hymn, Come, You Sinners, Poor and Needy. Let us pray, and we'll gather up our prayers and the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Um, the words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Gracious God, how we thank you for that invitation to come, to come to a Savior who is pure and, and holy, and yet come as sinners and receive your welcome. You know each of us so very, very well, and you love us deeply. You're able to be with each one to sustain us in an enormous variety of ways. It's like you're able to juggle some infinite number of balls and do so without panic, without stress. But with each one of us, you are watchful, you are patient, you are wise. Lord God, we are humbled by a sense of your great concern and your involvement in our daily concerns and worries your keen interest in our well-being. How we thank you that you didn't remain removed from us or hidden, but have made yourself known, especially coming to us in Jesus who shared our humanity. We give you thanks for the life of Jesus, how he showed the wisdom and care of a loving God, 
how he showed us of a God and told us of a God whose arms are open wide and welcome, but also a God who challenges, God who longs for us to overcome, a God who longs for us to grow as sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the assurance that God is with us here and now. Lord, we don't have to shout long distances to get your attention. We don't have to go looking in the hidden corners of life. But you have come to be with us, to live with us, even in the hurts and weaknesses of life, but also with us in the joys, the new opportunities, the new re newly realized or newly experienced gifts. So, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for life, for the wonder and, and complexity, the surprises, the opportunities of life. But also we thank you for the new life in Christ, for opportunities to repent, for the gift of new beginnings. Lord God, we know that you show mercy to those who turn to you in repentance. Let us experience that once more as we come seeking your forgiveness. We recall our lack of respect and care for others. We acknowledge our abuse and neglect of our particular talents and gifts. We ask forgiveness for the times when we have lived as if, as if this world and its wonders were all under our control and needed no reference to you. Forgive us for when we have failed to measure up to the standard expected of your disciples, and when our example has not influenced the world for good. Too often we have lived as if this earth and life upon this earth was the limit of our horizons, and we've disregarded the call of your kingdom the realities of your eternity, your new life, and your purposes for us in your kingdom. Now, hear us, gracious God, as in a moment's silence we confess before you our individual sin, Listen to the word of promise. The Scriptures say that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray and in whose words we gather up our prayers, our Father in heaven. We're reading from the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 33, starting at verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 33, the renewal of Ezekiel's call as watchman. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against a land, and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people. Then, if anyone hears the trumpet, but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. 
If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin, but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. <clears throat> so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. <clears throat> Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offences and sins weigh us down and we're wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Therefore, son of man, say to your people, if someone who is righteous disobeys, that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. And if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. The righteous person who sins will not be allowed to live, even though they were formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but they then turn away from their sin and do what is just and right, if they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right. They will surely live. <clears throat> Yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just, but it is their way that is not just. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, they will die for it. And if a wicked person turns away from their wickedness and does what is just and right, they will live by doing so. Yet you Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just, but I will judge each of you according to your own ways. Jerusalem's fall explained. In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has fallen. Now the evening before the man arrived, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened, and I was no longer silent. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land, but we are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. Therefore say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it and look to your idols and shed blood, should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword, you do detestable things, and each of you defiles his neighbour's wife. Should you then possess the land? Say this to them. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. As surely as I live, those who are left in the ruins will fall by the sword. Those out in the country I will give to the wild animals to be devoured, and those in strongholds and caves will die of a plague. I will make the land a desolate waste, 
and her proud strength will come to an end, and the mountains of Israel will become desolate so that no one will cross them. Then they will know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land a desolate waste because of all the detestable things they have done. As for you, son of man, your people are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. When all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Amen. So an easy hope versus hard hope. I wonder if you're good at hoping. Some things are easier to hope for than others, aren't they? Um, just for the last couple of weeks when I've been getting up in the morning, one of the things I've wanted to check with hope is have Team GB got any more medals at the Olympics? Sometimes that's easier to hope for, like when Adam Pitty was sw swimming in his final. He's going to win. He always wins. Other times the hope was not as keen, not as easy. Um, the rowing uh, squad, their, their dominance of previous Olympics we knew had gone, and so it was harder to hope that there would be gold medals. It's a, a reminder to us that dominance doesn't last forever. Even Adam Peaty is going to get beaten at some point. Sometimes hope's a bit harder for us, and because there's a responsibility on us to contribute to, to, to work towards the thing that we're hoping for. Um, so, for example, suppose we were inviting some friends around for, for dinner and we were hoping for a, a really nice evening together. Well, there are things we have to do beforehand. There are things that we have to get in the shopping and in the preparing of food and, and so on. We can't just simply turn up at the appointed, appointed night and time and hope that everything turns out well. Now, given what has been going on previously in the book of Ezekiel, we would expect hope to be something that's a bit hard, a bit difficult. The book began with Ezekiel and many fellow Jews in exile in Babylon, removed from the temple and the faith that they had practiced, and they thought God had failed. They thought God had let them down. But the first vision in chapter 1, Ezekiel was shown that God is with his people even in Babylon. And in the second vision, chapter 8, we saw that the Lord was preparing to leave Jerusalem, leaving it because of the unfaithfulness of his people there. They'd compromised with other beliefs and worldviews. They put their trust in military cooperation with ungodly nations rather than seek God first. They had behaved <coughs> badly and... and uh, <coughs> compromised in so many different ways to the, t the world around them. And God had had enough. Yet it was not that the Lord had given up entirely on his people. And when we looked last week at the parable in chapter 16, the emphasis was on the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. Now, what these chapters in Ezekiel have been saying to us today does have some particular and, and personal applications to our daily lives. But more, this, past, this, this book and the story of Ezekiel speaks to us as a church, as a people. God is speaking to a people through Ezekiel. He is speaking about their shared story, their shared situation, their shared experience. And our experience as church today, particularly those of us who are part of in the Church of Scotland, of one of the national churches, our experience is having been moved from a, a place of respect, a place of, of privilege at the center of things, to much more on the periphery. We don't have so many privileges these days, and in fact, there are still a lot of folks out there saying, even so, we still have too many. 
There's the weakening of church numbers and status. And we've been saying that that's not just due to the advance of science. That's not just due to materialism squeezing out the need and the practice for faith. It is, and, and I think we should seriously consider this, a judgment of God on the church today. Just as the people of Jer God leaving Jerusalem and, and that coming to be taken and captured was not because of God losing, but because of His active judgment on His people, we're actually in something of a similar place now. The Jews in Ezekiel's day found it hard to understand that it might be God's work that had taken them from Jerusalem. And we might find it hard to accept that church decline and failure in our time is God's judgment on us, a judgment on a church that had grown complacent, whose faith had become nominal, that had been too easily influenced by society around, a church that had become unclear about its purpose and mission in the world. So would God let the church of Scotland perish? Surely not. Well, the Jews in Ezekiel's day thought exactly the same about Jerusalem. And Jerusalem did fall, and the temple was destroyed. And in fact, it's in today's chapter, the chapter that Anne read for us, at verses 21 and 22, that that announcement comes. Here is the final nail in the coffin of easy hope. Here is the final nail in the coffin of the expectations that things would turn around. Now the unthinkable was real. The impossible has come to pass. And yet it's from that low point of the destruction of Jerusalem that hard hope, that real hope, begins to emerge. It was only when all the people were only focusing on and trusting in was taken from them, when all that stuff was removed, that they were in a place to listen and learn and, and see what God was doing, and especially to see what God was expecting of them and fr from them. And so from chapter 33 in Ezekiel, there's, there's a, a shift in emphasis as, as the prophet, under God's inspiration, is reaching out for this, this real, this lasting hope. The section begins, verses 1 to 9 of chapter 33, with a, a renewed call for Ezekiel to be God's watchman. It's a repeating of what was in chapter 3 at the, at the very beginning of Ezekiel's call. That's his role then is, is reaffirmed. The watchman's job was to, to bring to the people what, what, what was happening, what was going on. Ezekiel was still to warn the people of how God was angered when they tried to compromise their beliefs, but how God was longing for them to, to repent and turn to Him. And see, one of the things about the, the watchman is that he's not just passing on information, but he's passing on information that, that calls for a response. And so when in, a, in the city they had put a watchman up on the, on the tower to keep an eye out, if he saw an enemy coming and, and said that, people didn't say, all right, that's interesting, they would get ready for a fight. If he said there were, there were friends coming that he recognized on the horizon, people didn't say, all right, okay, fine. They, they would get some hospitality ready. The watchman's message was calling for a response. And when God was calling Ezekiel to be a watchman, he was making it plain, there's the opportunity to respond, there is still time here. God still longed to act on the promises of restoration for those who would turn and seek His face again. The person or nation or church that seeks God, that is repentant and turns from their wickedness, will find that the Lord is a God who is committed to forgive and to forget, verse 11. Much more would the Lord rather welcome back prodigals, restore the fortunes of the people, give life rather than issue death sentences. And so there is a call to act upon what the watchman is saying. Verse 11, turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? And this turning, this repentance, which is what it is, was practical. It involved undoing wrong and, and putting right in its place. And so verses 14 and 15, and, and 
It's talking about giving things back that have been stolen. It's talking about giving back what had been taken and, and as a pledge for a loan. And it's talking about replacing the, the kind of wrong things with things that are good. You see, repentance isn't just some kind of feeling that we have, uh, saying sorry and moving on. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 4 as, as though it's, we're taking off one set of clothes and putting on another. Now, that doesn't happen just naturally or by accident. It, it, it takes specific intent. It takes particular actions to say, that's wrong, I shall undo it, and I shall put on something that, that's corrective, that's better. So, what might be, what are the key areas of repentance in church life today? Ezekiel, remember, is speaking to a people, and now is the people of God. What is now being under the judgment of God, just as they were in Ezekiel's time. What are our issues for repentance? I think the pandemic has given good opportunity to take a fresh look at that. But I have to say, I'm worried. I'm worried that the, by that we must get back as soon as we can to doing what we were before. We must put our, our things back in place as if we had not been noticing that it hadn't been working very well. Well, maybe it worked well in terms of we liked it, but church decline has, has reached critical. And the decline of the church in the West, I submit, is God's judgment. So, why is there this rush to say, let's gather as we gathered before in exactly the same way and do the same things as before, gather at the same time as before? Why is that so key? Why is that so important? It hasn't worked so very well, has it? There are so many members of, of Claremont whose children, whose grandchildren, absolutely nowhere in terms of Christian involvement and, and personal faith. What we had didn't work for them. And yet, having come out of, or coming out, we trust, of 18 months of I'm not being able to meet in that kind of way. The first thing people say is, well, let's, let's do that again. Let's get back to it. Is it really more important to get back to a meeting at a time um, of, of, uh, of day that doesn't really seem to have connected in terms of making us better disciples and calling others to be disciples? That's worrying. What I'm trying to sum up the issue in front of us, I think it's a problem of putting the institution first. The way, we, the way we do things around here, the notion of turning up and giving assent is all that we need to do. You see, the sad reality is that we are guilty of running a club for the right likes of us rather than building a Jesus-shaped community, a people intent on serving others, sharing faith, learning to grow in faith, people of sacrificial giving, commitment to others, and not just the ones that we happen to get along with, and so on. In a similar way, Ezekiel and his fellow exiles were being challenged to rethink what they had become. Look at chapter 8. That's, that's not how it should end up. And is there not a similar mismatch between what the New Testament says about the church and the institutional religious club that the Kirk has become? But there is the opportunity for repentance. And repentance is cleansing. True repentance, verse 16, wipes out the past. None of the sins that the person has committed after repentance will be remembered against them. Now, I think it's good for us to remember past failure sometimes so that it keeps us on our toes not to do more of the same. But God says He will not remember. He will not hold our sins against us. Forgiveness is not partial or temporary. The charges will be dropped. The slate will be wiped clean. The debt cancelled. 
The issue is not how much good or bad is there in, in your past and which one is greater. The issue is which way are you facing now? Have you turned? Verse 11. For those who turn and throw themselves on the mercy of God, our sins are removed as far as the east from the west, Psalm 103. Our sins are blotted out, Isaiah 43. They are trampled underfoot and cast to the depths of the sea, Micah 7. Repentance is cleansing and makes a huge difference. And yet, so often it's still easy hope that folks are after. People seem to have an an, an infinite capacity to reinterpret things in ways that suits themselves. Remember how the Serbians assessed the Balkan, Balkan warfare, making themselves out to be the victims when they were in fact the perpetrators. Football fans assessing the referee week by week. Donald Trump's definition of election results. People seem to be, go to extraordinary lengths sometimes, have an amazing capacity to reinterpret in a way that has little to do with reality. And in Ezekiel's time, there were still those in Israel, still part of the institution, still rejecting the reality of exiles, still accepting that this was God's work and God's judgment on them. And so in verse 24, they're they're trying to wriggle out of it. Well, you know, there's just one guy called Abraham and he possessed the land, but there's lots of us now, so surely we can hang on to the land. But of course, Abraham didn't possess the land. He was gifted the land. And while he was promised it for him and his descendants, it was while they remained obedient to the Lord, and this lot hadn't, verses 25 and 26. They wanted the easy way. They wanted easy easy, easy hope. Hope without working for it. Hope without questioning their presuppositions and and their values and habits. They wanted hope without having to change. Hope without reshaping their life around the Lord. Hope where they didn't have to turn. And it's important to see that that hope was false. Not primarily because it was placed in the wrong things, but because it was not accompanied by any sense of responsibility on their part. It was not accompanied by any sense that they had to have their lives reshaped by God. They thought, you see, God had made promises. He had. They thought that in Jerusalem they were in the Lord's city. They were. They thought the temple was God's dwelling place. It was. They thought the kings descended from David were God's appointed rulers to them. They were. But all of those things, instead of encouraging them to seek God first, led them into complacency and compromise. And so keen was the Lord of life to reach out to them, that he removed those props. No more a great people, no more kings, no more temple, no more city of Zion. But that did not mean no more of the Lord. You see, Ezekiel begins to unfold from this chapter promises of a new beginning. And the challenge is that for the people, that new beginning was on the far side of repentance. God is removing a lot of the props that the Kirk hung on to for so many years. It's placed at the top table, it's buildings right, left, and center, and It's particular ways of of doing things, and a lot of it's man-built traditions. They're having to go if they've not gone already. And it's God's judgment. And it's God's judgment not because he's in some 
tantrum of, right, that's it. But it's a, a removal of the props that we might reshape ourselves around what God has called us to be and what God has gifted us in Christ. Ezekiel 33 makes it clear that both yes and no are possible answers to God's call. And it's the same for us. Renewal and restoration is on the other side of our being a religious club. It's on the other side of institutionalism. It's on the other side where we see the church as just something in and of itself rather than as an instrument for God's work in the world. And so, you see, I'm not at all sure that the key thing is when can we get back to our services? When can we get the religious club up and running again? The key thing is when are we going to learn to be servants of Christ in the world? When are we going to wear actively and enthusiastically the way of one, Mark 10, who did not come to be served but to serve? Well, we, when will we give ourselves energetically and as a priority and seriously to God's priority, which is that we are to be and to make disciples? Because that's what Jesus told his followers to do, wasn't it? He didn't send them in the world to start an institution. He didn't send them in the world to have particular meetings at particular times in a particular fashion, but rather to be a movement of disciple-makers. And we've not been. Even the instances in most cases of our sons and daughters and grandchildren show that. But is there hope? Yes, there is. You see, it was just as that low point came, verses 21 and 22, with the destruction of Jerusalem, just when they were face to face with, this is not working, that the beginning of real hope, hard hope, of restoration and renewal was possible. But it's on the other side of repentance. Let us pray. Lord, even Jesus was confronted by folks who wanted easy hope and who rejected him and rejected his hard hope. The crowds who began to follow and then disappeared when what he said was too challenging, when what he said was too personally threatening. And yet when he turned to his disciples and said, are you going to? They said, where else would we go? Where else are the words of eternal life? Lord, give us that kind of clear-sighted faith that sees that it's you you have the words of life, and as you make plain through Ezekiel, you long for us to receive these words of life. You, you long for us to be restored and reshaped and renewed. But not without repentance. Not without turning away from things that we shouldn't trust in. And without being open to your call and your leading. So give us the grace to hear what you call us to, to hear what you're calling your church to be and to do in the world today. That, Lord, we might enjoy more of the fullness of life that you offer in and through Jesus your Son, and our Saviour. 
Amen. Well, of course, we cannot start from a place other than where we find ourselves. And one of the great bits of the gospel, one of the good news of, of Jesus' message to us is that we don't need to find a new place to start from. We come to Him just as we are. He will receive us when we come to Him just as I am. And that's our next hymn. After we've sung this hymn, we'll confess our faith together in the uh, words of the Apostles' Creed. Tim Ward is going to be leading us in a prayer for others and in our closing hymn, which affirms there is a hope. Father, you make all things new. 
with a new day begun, we praise you as creator of all that we see in the world that you have made. Help us to know and understand that you have given all of us stewardship over it. But all is not how it should be or how it could be. So we ask forgiveness, Father, for the times we have ignored your voice and not cared for the world that you have given us. By your Spirit, renew us and breathe into us new life and purpose. Help us to see all life as a precious gift from you. What we give in return seems so small by comparison, but we ask you to bless what we do give, that it will bring help to those who need it. Father, as we bring to you now our concerns for others, be near to us and lead us as we pray. Lord, for us here in this country, the COVID pandemic is largely under control and the risk of serious illness and dying has become much less, and we are thankful for that. What we hear now is the expression, learning to live with COVID as it becomes endemic in the population at large. Our experience of the past 18 months or so will not have been the same for everyone. The impact of the pandemic has not been felt equally across our communities. The effects of COVID and society having to deal with suppressing the spread of the virus has simply made existing divides wider. So what now? Do we simply adjust to a new but different normality or do we at least try and shape that, what that will look like? The time seems right for us to pause, take as it were a collective breath and begin to reflect on the past year of the pandemic and what has it been like for us. As we do that, help us, Lord, not to shy away from being honest with you and honest with ourselves in questioning our faith and examining our trust in you, both now and as we move forward. Which countries of the world, ours included, are in this better phase of the pandemic by virtue of having procured and delivered vaccines to nearly all our citizens? But this is still not the case for the rest of the world. So we pray again that the vaccine production and delivery to poor countries will be speeded up over the coming year. We pray for those who have lost work and income during the pandemic and who find themselves more reliant on food banks than before, or perhaps have had to rely on them for the first time. May they be shown compassion and understanding and not be made to feel either a failure or worthless in any way. We pray too that the need for people to rely on food banks in such large numbers is one of the things that is gone from any new normal that appears. We pray, Lord, for all those who have lost someone dear to them over this time. We ask for peace to come to them and for your love to uphold them. We pray for all those in our health services, in our emergency services and those essential workers who have been on the front line of dealing with the virus and trying to suppress it. As the pandemic and its effects reduce, we pray that all will have time to recover from the stress that has been brought to their lives. We pray for Gordon and church leaders everywhere who have worked hard to keep the church going during the last year and a half. We pray too for all the active steps being taken to establish a new normal for our church life and a return to being able to meet and worship together. We thank you, Lord, for your pattern of work and rest, of doing and not doing. So for all those who have had the chance to have a break already or are soon to go on holiday, we pray that it will have been or will be a time of enjoyment, relaxation and recovery, a time to reset things. Lord, remind us that whatever storms life brings, you are near. While the storm rages, we have feelings of calamity, of dread, and we feel uncertain and anxious. Lord, help us to trust that you are near to us, both in the storm and in the calm, as you have promised. From the Gospels, we have these words. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, 
Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Amen.